Well, hello and welcome to uh, the Orlando Museum of Art's Art Sandwich Den. I'm David Madison. I'm the OMA's Associate Curator of Education and Outreach. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to just go over a few of the features in our Zoom classroom this afternoon. Uh, the participant chat is the best place to share comments publicly with the group, but questions for our speakers should be asked in the Q&A located at the bottom of your screen in that toolbar. I will address questions at the end of the program. Today, I am joined by three incredible advocates for the arts in our local community, all of whom have a deep, I have a deep appreciation and respect for. I'm so grateful that they've taken the time out of their day to share more about a new exciting public art exhibition that has been organized by the Downtown Arts District and the Corridor Project. Pat Green is joining us. He is the project's curator and the founder of the Corridor Project. And from the Downtown Arts District, we have uh, the executive director, Barbara Hartley, and Hani Hogan, the development and marketing manager. Welcome to everyone. Thank you for being here. Hi. Thank you for having us, David. Absolutely. I'm just so excited about the billboard project. I was driving by, I think on Curry Ford and I saw one and I was like with a friend and I was like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And, and so I'm just yeah, really yeah. excited to hear about it. It's really fun to come on when you don't know they're there. You know, you just walk out yeah. and you drive up and, and I was with Hani and we so were like, oh wait, what's that? You know, that's over there. There were Yeah, um, it's a surprise. <laughs> Not when you're expecting it, exactly. Yeah, like on Curry Ford. You know, yeah, cool. exactly, exactly. Outside of a liquor store, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I, I'm not sure who's starting today. Pat, are you? I will, oh, I will start. Um, I'm doing like a quick, like three minute crash course in um, like an art historical context. Then Barbara will chat about downtown arts district and how this happened. And then Pat will take us on a journey through all of the curated works. Wonderful, awesome. Thank you. Do I share my screen now, David? Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, can you see my screen? Just that looks fine? great. Awesome. All right, everyone, thank you for joining us. Yes, we're gonna talk about the Corridor Project Billboard Exhibition. Just like David said, my name's Haani Hogan. I'm the Development and Marketing Manager at Downtown Arts District. Um, I'm just doing a quick historical context of um, where the Billboard Project kind of falls into the world of like art history and advertising. Um, <clears throat> so I start, I can't do it without starting. Uh, with this work of art here. So when the Moulin Rouge opened, um, Toulouse-Lautrec was one of the main artists to like make it iconic. And he displayed his paintings near the entrance of the um, venue. And he himself was a conspicuous fixture of the place and was commissioned to create a six foot tall advertisement that launched his poster making career and made him, which made him famous overnight. And he turned a spotlight to the crowded dance floor of the nightclub and its star performers, um, the boneless acrobat, which is in the front, and then the glutton, who is the can-can dancer. So in this time, 3,000 copies of this advertisement for the Moulin Rouge were displayed in the streets of Paris in December of that year. And the poster made this artist famous overnight and he quickly came to be seen as one of the greatest print designers of all time and so here's a photo of the example of him standing next to a different poster um, that he used so i like i said this is crash course so i'll just jump real quick you can't talk about like art and advertising or inspired by advertising without you know crediting or talking about pop art so i these Three artists, Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, and James Rosenquist, they were the central figures of pop art in New York, um, which they all fell within the realm of fine art, but with this traditional context, they explored subject matter and devices of popular culture. Um, they recognized that imagery of mass culture rather than a direct encounter with nature. So there's a quote by, um, 
pop culture producer and critic John Carlin, who ca characterized their work as reality, but almost on the level of the sign, like so an image with that's a sign. And when we talk about these three artists, uh, they even developed commercial art techniques in order to evoke a strong feeling of mass production. Warhol used photo silk screening. Lichtenstein's style alluded to the commercial process of printing flat color areas in dots and Rosenquist painted in the style of billboards. Um, so yeah, I pulled um, a couple examples of artists that were specifically commissioned for advertisements. So um, on the left between 1928 and 1935, Norman Walk. Norman Rockwell painted six different illustrations that were used in Coca-Cola calendars, serving trays, posters, and uh, one Saturday evening post ad. His best known illustration for Coca-Cola was perhaps Out Fishing, which is what's on the left here. And it depicts the young boy resembling Tom Sawyer sitting on a tree stump fishing, uh, accompanied by his Coca-Cola. And then on the right, we have um, N.C. Wyeth, so the father of Andrew Wyeth. Um, and he was commissioned for multiple Coca-Cola um, illustrations um, in the 30s. And so this is one example here of uh, set against a New England coastline with a bearded old sailor leaning on his boat, um, again, with, with the Coca-Cola bottle. So like I said, the billboard project is this kind of hybrid between art advertising, but then it's also public art. So you'll see, as we discuss more, Pat and I often kept referring to the billboards as murals because in our heads, that's kind of what they are, but they exist on billboards. So I couldn't talk about murals without talking about the mural revolution of Mexico. And so here I have two of the three um, Los Tres Grandes. So the three great ones uh, considered for like kind of the fathers or leaders of the mural, um, revolution of Mexico. So it's Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente uh, Orozco, and then David Siqueiros. So these are two examples of murals. And when we talk about murals, we say that we, you know, use the example of its art on flat surfaces in public space, generally done, you know, by painting. But then we can also talk about street art. So we have these two examples here. We have Keith Haring on the left and uh, Shepherd Ferry on the right. So still elements of murals, but not necessarily done in the super formal context of how you do a mural. But regardless, it's art in public space. And I wanted to uh, address that and use those as examples to kick off today. So now we'll go to Barbara, who will talk about Downtown Arts District and kind of why we were connected to this project in the first place. Thank you, Hani. I really appreciate you sharing the context um, and background of art and, and advertising as well as public art that adds so much to the conversation. And uh, Patrick Green will share that several of the artists have advertising backgrounds. So I think it's um, a, a really interesting connection. Um, so I'm Barbara Hartley, the Executive Director of Arts, and we exist for the arts community and for our artists. Um, I, I look at it as an ecosystem where, you know, um, one leads to the other, to the other, to the other. And Orlando is such a great place for the arts because we have such great collaborations with our uh, partner arts organizations. Our mission is to lead, stimulate, and guide the development of a vibrant, innovative, arts and cultural district that enhances economic development in downtown Orlando. So the downtown arts district was developed in 2000 and became a not-for-profit in 2002. Um, we were in, we were formerly in the uh, building known as the Dr. Phillips building on the corner of Orange Avenue and Pine. Um, so we uh, started that gallery in 2006, and it was known as City Arts Factory. In 2018, the Downtown Arts District moved the gallery space to the, the Rogers Keeney building, which is on the National Historic Registry. Uh, so that beautiful green picture of uh, the building that we're in 
is where we live now. It's the oldest building in downtown commercial building. And it was, um, it was built in the 1800s. Um, so it was restored by Ford Keeney, who uh, loved the arts and wanted to bring more of an arts culture to downtown. He was instrumental in developing the downtown arts district as well. And he donated the building to the city of Orlando in 2018, um, where we are now the stewards of this beautiful building for 20 years and um, hope that it will continue. And as I said, we serve the arts community by hosting several events in the gallery and outside of the gallery. Uh, so our biggest event is the Third Thursday Gallery Hop, which has now been rebranded to Third Thursday Orlando Arts Making History. So in addition to the gallery exhibits at City Arts, you can also experience the uh, History Center at no charge. Uh, there's a market, a, a maker's market in front of the History Center and music that's in partnership with the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center. In addition to uh, Third Thursday, we have Orlando Story Club in between series, which is a music program. Um, Access was a conversation that we have continued about uh, uh, BIPOC artists in the art world and how to do a better job and create more access in various positions. And then Dia de los Muertos um, is a long-standing program and street party. So the art is Dia and Monster themed, and there's a big kickoff in uh, Dia de los Muertos fashion. Break for Art is new. So this is a pilot program. Um, it's a street performance program. And currently we're just doing a trial on the corner of uh, Church Street and Orange Avenue in a partnership with Highwoods Properties and the Downtown Development Board. So we pay stipends to the performers and it can be any type of performance from uh, live painting to singing, dancing, um, instrumental music. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. We hope to continue and grow that program. And then Art and Soul actually came out of the Access program. So through those conversations, we started working with a young artist um, named Tyla Harrington. She's very successful in her own rights of producing films, not films, but films, um, video and uh, photography. And then she does, um, she, she owns a band called Soul Based Band. So they perform the second Wednesday of every month in the gallery. Next slide. And our role in the community is also to incubate organizations and to work with artists and helping them to grow. Um, so we were instrumental in being the fiscal agent for Creative City Project, which, which has grown tremendously and is one of the biggest downtown uh, festivals at this time. Um, it's now called Immerse, but it's uh, produced by Creative City Project and Fusion Fest, which is going into its fourth year. Um, we were the fiscal agent for three years and continue to be um, involved in promoting and helping to um, curate art as needed. Other, other um, opportunities and have um, worked with partners on is um, mural projects asked to help um, uh, that was uh, engaged with city arts. So the city arts muralist this year was Peter Van Peter um, Guerriere, who is an artist and has a studio space in the building. His uh, studio is called Red Tape. And uh, they also run another business next door called Color Me Places, which is a place for artists to get lower quantity prints. Um, so prints, t-shirts, and, and other um, uh, lower quantity volume. But it's a way to help support the local artists. And then we love the project. Um, and let, we've taken artists to Art Basel over the last uh, five years excluding the year of the pandemic shut down. And last year we, we did tours instead of um, bringing the artists down. But that is something we're really proud of uh, because we want the world to see all the great talent that's here in Orlando. And um, as you know, there's not as many gals a way to give our artists additional exposing collectors and that other uh, we've um, we've served the community with um, you know through the years 2,771 um, artists this past year, and we did the the um, 
the picture on the lower right hand corner is a project with Bloomingdale's. So that was the, um, the dressing room project. We engaged several artists to paint murals in the dressing rooms to um, really add some life and vibrancy. We're hoping that that continues on. Next slide. We get involved with um, other projects as well. So we worked with Orlando Health on a mural project. Uh, Christian Stanley did this beautiful lounge. Um, so they want to help um, their client and, and patrons and, and employees to get to know the local arts community. Um, so we have uh, a quarterly project with them where we showcase local original art. And then Bloomingdale's also, we have a, a gallery in the Bloomingdale space. And we're working with the city on a project called uh, Bring Kindness to the Table, where we're asking local artists to paint a picnic table, and the tables will be in the different uh, districts of the commissioners. So two tables for each district, and uh, that's just a way to, you know, encourage outdoor activities and also to have positivity through the arts. And all of, all of this really helps to bring more conversation to downtown and um, give opportunities to the artists. Um, so we're very community based, um, but as I said, it's an ecosystem. We like to be a place where we bring in first time artists, but also we continue artists with established and emerging, continue conversations with established and emerging artists so that truly it's a place for everyone to showcase and to learn from each other. And, um, you know, outside of the, the gallery spaces, um, we've done other projects like Art Nod Places. And um, this is where I think we did our first project with Patrick Green, who was working at Gallery of Avalon Island for the Downtown Arts District at the time. So we did the Art Nod Places three years in a row, uh, 2015 through 2017. And um, when Patrick brought us this idea, um, we thought it was a really great thing to bring to the community. Um, what's, what's interesting about our organization is, you know, we have a small staff and, um, you know, we have a large impact on a lot of projects and programs, but we can pivot pretty quickly on ideas that are presented to us. So when Patrick came to um, Hani and myself, he explained the concept of the billboard project and um, we have relationships with the billboard companies. Um, what was interesting is, you know, he didn't want to do just the digital boards. Um, so most of the advertising that we've done in the past uh, for programming has been on digital boards. Um, but for this project, he really wanted the field to be, you know, um, on printed material so that it was uh, more static. So. We, we um, agreed to do the project um, because it brings a lot of attention to art and it also exposes non um, patrons of the arts to the artwork. So it creates a conversation with people that may or may not go to museums and or to galleries. Um, so from there, we just started the conversation and it was, it's been a great journey and I think the artists loved it. Um, you know, in doing projects, one of the things that we look at is, you know, what's the timing? Um, can it be done successfully? And what is the expense? So when when we spoke with um, Patrick, of course, there were a lot of expenses in producing this program. And uh, we all agreed that we would jointly go after sponsorship. Um, and he was very instrumental in bringing in sponsors so that, you know, so we could pay for the uh, production, but also give the artists stipends. Um, so 30 artists were recognized. Um, we had a, a presenting sponsor that allowed us to pay for the billboards. Um, so Clear Channel was a partner and they gave us a really great opportunity to um, basically get them at cost. Um, so we pay for the printing and the installation, which is amazing. And it's a good opportunity for Orlando Health, who was our sponsor as well. They got a lot of great exposure on 30 plus billboards. So 30 static boards and 10 digital boards. 
So with that, I would like to bring Patrick Green on board to talk about how he came up with this idea and uh, you know, why Downtown Arts District and what the process was like, how, how, how did you think it turned out? Uh, thank you, everyone. I no, I, I um, I've been thinking about this for a long time because I was out of the country when I was younger for two years, over two years, and I came back. And one of the first things I noticed was billboards, and I thought, wow, they're like everywhere. And I kind of thought, why can't they have like occasional like art or something, something that's not just advertising too? Because I felt like they're they could be a little more since they're a part of the landscape. They could be more interesting. So I've been thinking about this for quite a while. And then I realized that some people did this in, in Los Angeles, who the one guy who's in charge of that project ended up calling me about this. We had a great conversation for like an hour. But he shows artists from all over the world. And I wanted to focus on the local talent because like what Barbara was saying about Art Basel bringing local artists down there because I felt like Orlando's not really known as an outside of Orlando, it's not known as an artist place, and it, and I feel like it should be. And what a, a better way to do it is to put the art on the highway. <laughs> People are going to Tampa or wherever they can come and see this, and it's uh, you know like going like a honey and I went by Cafe Linger in College Park, and there's a a billboard Erica Sobrick's uh, billboard sitting out there, and it's just kind of amazing. And, and as David mentioned, the ones on Curry Ford and they're also kind of on these little kind of roads that we all go to. But I, I really wanted to, I mean, I have a sort of mixed feeling of being a slight art snob, but also wanting, but I'm really more community minded in the end. And one of the reasons I uh, approached, a big reason I approached uh, Downtown Arts District is uh, because I've been working with them. I, I ran, as they mentioned, the, where the City Arts is now was Gallery at Avalon Island. From 2013 to 2018, I was the gallery director and curator. And I even lived in the apartment for three years upstairs. And I kind of thought, you know, I, I, I knew that it would be advantageous for me to go to a nonprofit to get a billboard company. But also, I have a relationship with Barbara and Hani and Kat and everybody. And I don't want to, and I wanted to, I mean, if there's any success for me that, you know, could be shared, I'd rather share it with them than some, you know, somebody else that I haven't been dealing with or something that I don't have a relationship with. So, um, but it's also, it was really kind of interesting to look at, because we had so many submissions and I picked, there's 30 artists all together. I picked 11 pre-picks, curator picks, and then we, 19 from um, submissions, which I think we had, was it close to like 300? Or submissions or something like that or close to 300 I think yeah it was uh over 270 yeah and the thing that's difficult and sometimes I would like you know like ask Hani what like but the thing is difficult like when you look there were so many amazing submissions that I didn't pick and also you're also trying to think of in the context of where it's going to be on a billboard so it's not going to be so it, there's not going to be as much nuanced art it's going to be a little more like marketing and like um, some of the the uh, examples that Hani was showing before, like uh, Ray Lichtenstein and different people. Like maybe it doesn't have to be that, but they they knew that their stuff was going to be very public and it was kind of done in a, a commercial, like borrowing from a commercial context. And um, I uh, and I looked at like people also like Edward Ruscha, LA artist, and the people that are really they feel like they borrowed from graphic design and advertising and like and the art world and i felt like it was i kind of like the idea that because a lot of public art is seems to have some controversy or people either don't like it or they you know or they ignore it or whatever and i felt like and i'm really a fan of more temporary public art because that way well if you didn't like this we'll show another one soon you know or whatever and i, I really like the idea of democratizing the experience of looking at art too, like going down the highway. Because when I was running the gallery at Avalon Island, there was a, people would come in all the time and tell me how they were intimidated by the gallery experience. And I had always been 
thinking about how could I lessen that, but sometimes lessening that involves them getting in first, which if they're intimidated, they might not come in. So like when I um, brought Art on Places down from New York, that, that was part of like, I'd also done a walk on by, which I did again, May last year in, in 2012. And I think um, we're probably gonna do it in a few months again, I'm talking to Zach Alfson in the milk district, but I don't, I want, I want people to feel like there's like, when, oh, when I was at the gallery, David Moran and I did a, the uh, trip project, transit interpretation project, and we asked artists to participate. And I said, I don't, we don't want to see your portfolio. Or I mean, no, we don't want to, but we don't care about your portfolio. If you want to participate, you can participate. So I'm kind of trying to find also ways where like less likely suspects are, are involved and in, in kind of in, in this, this project, I was trying to mix it up with some people that everybody knows and then some lesser known that kind of, and I wanted to um, mix up the type of artwork. That's why I intentionally didn't want a theme. And um, do you want me to say something about these, Hani? You can, Pat. I, I included all 30 billboards in this yeah, I can. PowerPoint if you want to. I thought that was a good segue, yeah. how you were like talking about you know, some pretty well-known artists versus, you know, artists that not as many people in the community know. Well, like Arthur Dawson, I still haven't met him. <laughs> I don't know, but I really like his art. And also it just felt like it was, it's such good art for like such perfect uh, imagery for a billboard. Because it has also the element of community and it has, uh, and it feels like there's a story there, but it's not really kind of a, clear what that narrative is but it's really there's something that that really makes it interesting too and then ashley taylor who uh, we've known for quite a while and she was at flying horse and she's uh, a super talented artist and she's also really amazing to work with and i think that that factors into as we all know when we put art shows together that that um, you know you don't we don't have to love you but just be easy to work with <laughs> just um, and Boy Kong, who I think a lot of people around town um, know his art, and it's on a lot of buildings, murals, and all that. His this is a little bit different than what we'd seen most of his work. Like we just, yeah, you were talking about we were talking about Hani, but um, but he's always he's always interesting, and he's always and he's definitely got a presence, and he's one of those people that's very well known around town. Um, Charles Hodges, who's been teaching at Daytona College for years. And um, he's, he's known um, as a professor and a photographer, and he's also kind of involved in really what's like kind of some social commentary. And I really love this piece, sort of a mixed meat, like a bit of a collage-ish kind of like on Harriet Tubman. It's really a beautiful piece. Yeah, I think in my interview with him um, after he was selected, I think he told me that there are like 18 layers this piece oh that's right you told me this yeah, yeah yeah it's pretty cool and chris rob full disclosure we grew up together and we um have known each other since we were maybe like 15. we played baseball against each other we used to bit play baseball and surf but he's a, a great he was a great ahead of me and he was like the guy who like we were not the normal baseball players. He went away to New York after school and became an artist. And he lived next door to, I think, the Dead Boys punk rock band. And he was, he was in a show. His very first show in 1980 was with Keith Keith Haring, or not his first show, but his Keith Haring's very first New York show. Chris Robb was in that show in 1980, and several other really well-known artists. And he's just solid and. We've had this like exchange of books and art since we were teenagers. And he's just like never stopped doing it, you know? So I kind of like, I said, and he's also a very well-known artist around town. I, wanna, and, I, wanted to add, I wanted to add something about Chris Robb. So he was so excited about being in this project because his career has been advertising and he's yeah. worked on so many billboard campaigns for his clients, but this was the first time he was actually showcasing his art on a billboard. So it was really special for him. 
Yeah, we had, we had, we had talked to um, a friend of ours from high school, Rex Beach, who at Lamar Advertising, and uh, Barbara, I think you know him too. And um, but he'd also like Craig from Clear Channel, and everybody seemed to kind of know each other, and it was kind of really interesting the conversations we got because I realized that people are more excited about this in the Billboard world than I sort of anticipated. Um, and Stanley, is it Chris? Does he see it's Christian? Is, yeah, Christian. Christian. I don't, he's, he's new, a little bit new to me. I've seen his work around, but I know that Hani and Barbara, as I mentioned, they've worked with him, but his stuff is really great. And it also, the context is perfect. It's also perfect for a billboard, but it's also uh, perfect for where we live too, which I like. I also would like to have an Orlando. I like the idea that, you know, there's an LA type of art or it doesn't have to be one type of art, but you know, but I love the idea that Orlando, like Christian feels like that guy. Um, crummy gummy. <laughs> this is his grandmother, which I have to. I love this, and um, she uh, went for this. And I've known um, him mm -hmm. for about for quite a while. I was doing freelance for the museum, and he was um, an intern. And, and uh, so we've been friends for maybe since two thousand eight or something like that. But he's he's always been solid. We've been. Uh, his stuff is funny, but it really kind of hits you too. You know, <laughs> there's something like it's like funny at first, and you go like, "Ooh!" You look at it again, you're kind of doing that um, second take. And he's a great guy too. Uh, Daniel Harris, or well, that's not his meal. I don't know that's how to say his name, but yes, Daniel. And his collages, oh my god! And I'm, but that that image on a highway <laughs> is so good. But it's so great. His collages are just so, they're so much fun and they're kind of slightly disturbing, but they're really beautiful. And um, he's, he was another, he's a, probably a little bit lesser known. He's kind of known for more zines around here, but he's a guy that I thought his stuff needed to get out there. And now I believe Crummy Gummy sold his piece at the gallery exhibit. Yeah, he did. I actually know the person who bought it and they sent me a picture of it in their living room. So, um, and Erica Greer is, I think, our only Polk County representative, and she's young and um, hasn't been, hasn't shown as much as some of the other people, but I really love her digital work, and it was just, uh, it's really great stuff, and it's, um, and I feel like that was like another, like a mix of some kind of like when you look down below at the other Erica, like the, the difference between those two pieces, but they're really both, they both really stand out, and they're really beautiful. But, um, and Erica Sobrak, who I think seems like most people around here know her, she's well known. Her, and her stuff is that sort of, I think, uh, to take a, a cue from Ryan Rivas, it's kind of a suburban gothic or something. It's really, um, it's really got, it's got that look that we all know, you know, and it's really well done and they look like they're, they're re very realistic. But, um, you're right. You're right. Her work is always familiar, even if it, if it, you haven't been to the place, you feel like you've been there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think what's fun about Erica Sobrax is like her works are so small to begin with the originals. So to see it like blown up onto a billboard is oh, yeah. really cool to experience it in large scale. I'm always surprised to see like when she sends an image and I see like, oh, it's that small, you know, so. Well, and, and I think that's a good point too. the scale of what's on the billboards, you know, some of the pieces look like they're larger pieces, but when you see it in the exhibit at the gallery, um, you know, it was very different. So that was um, interesting and, you know, definitely makes you want to go see it next year to, to get a better idea of that scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Gabriella, I love that piece because it's also like the way we were saying, uh, Erica's looks familiar, this definitely, if you live here, this looks familiar. And it's like, there's something a little bit haunting about it too. It's like, it's beautiful nature shot, but, but it's kind of like, not, you know, like hyper real or anything. So it has a little bit of a, has almost a little like an extension of what, what Erica Sobrax. And I have, I still haven't met Gabriella, but I really have been paying attention to her work and I love it. And she's young too. I think she's just getting out of college or something. She's in her senior year at okay. UCF. And Haley McCormick, um, who I think is our only Volusia County rep, uh, artist, she's been doing some really interesting, like she did those textile pieces that we had at the gallery 
over that she submitted, but we also, she does video art and she's kind of worked in every medium. And I kind of just, um, she's been doing some pieces at like music shows and different things like that. And I kind of, I know Matt, Matthew Moyer was covering a lot of her stuff at the weekly. And I just really thought she's sort of all over the place, but it always seems interesting and well done. And I really, she's another young artist that I wanted to get out there. So, uh, John Baker, <laughs> this piece makes me laugh. It kind of feels like John Baker, if you know him, because it just <laughs> has this like understated kind of, um, I don't know, it's, but it's also really, it also has that another feel like, um, honey, when we were talking the Florida project art that we, the, that one area mm -hmm. where it has this sort of like, it's not disturbing, but there's something like, we don't know this story, you know, there's something a little bit missing, but it's, I love his photography and he, um, he teaches at Creality, right? I think now too. So. Yes. And Justin Looper, God, I love his work. He does all kinds of, he also makes furniture and he makes bags. He does all kinds of things, but he, um, he's the new director at the Castleberry Art House and he's been doing some great shows since he got there. And he's another person who I feel like was, has been sort of underrepresented, but he's sort of on the cusp of all, you know, like, I feel like he's just gonna, he's, people are gonna start asking for him to show. Tonight. And that piece also, is actually, what's that? Also for the folks watching or who joined us, his original piece is the size of a mural. I was, I was just gonna say that. I was just gonna say how big, <laughs> that, that's like probably bigger than his billboard. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and Kara, uh, who she's shown a few times when I was uh, doing Avalon Gallery, and uh, she's another person that's kind of like working in several mediums, and I think she studied photography in college, but she, she's like a person that you'd think at this point she would probably be doing one thing, which I'm kind of glad she's not, because she does, every time I look at her art, I'm like, oh, wow, she's work, now she's doing something completely different, and it's totally um, interesting and beautiful and and this like like I I feel like I don't I don't know what's going on in the top here but it <laughs> it's kind of menacing but it's also kind of it's colorful so it's like kind of pretty too too I mean it's like really well done mm -hmm. and then Kyle who goes by Kyle who teaches at Valencia he's been at it for a while and he's represented by a gallery in Miami and he, um, he's just a super, one of my favorite, really super interesting artists. And um, this picture was actually on the cover of Artborn Magazine, which was around 2016, 17, which was here for a year. Really brilliant piece, really um, kind of like a local context with the, the astronaut and then the woman floating, which is really kind of interesting and a little bit kind of like a very dreamlike too. Also, Pat, just to let you know, we're at a little less than five minutes because we do want to open for questions from the public. Okay. okay. And Leah Sandler, who does a lot of stuff too, does just came out with a book. Really, really love her stuff. And this really, I, I loved how this looked on a billboard. And Luce Sky, oh my God, I love his stuff too. And this stuff in real life, like a lot of this stuff is so much cooler in real life. So that sometimes when you see them on slides, there's not much you can do about it, but they're really, so we can go to the next one. And Leah's uh, was digital as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Mary Bell, who I'd never met until this show, and I really love her stuff. And it's like, I'd seen some of her stuff and I was just like, man, this stuff is so great. And it's kind of like, it's a very different, it's very different than the rest of it because it's dark, but it's also just like, it's very classical, beautiful. and. Um, they're all her, right, Honey? Is that yeah. yeah. She's she's yeah. her own model, so she always yeah. does self-portraits. And Maureen Hudis, who I actually worked with um, painting like 20 years ago or so uh, when I was doing some scenic art, and I've known her, and she's, or well, Maureen's also another person that I love to work with, and she showed at Gallery at Avalon Island a couple of times, and she's just always brilliant. I mean, you can just let her go and do whatever she decides to do it, it's going to be great. So, uh, Natasha Harrison, one of the Florida Project artists that we call, 
really, I love this piece. Because it also does feel very for a project, but it feels very familiar. Like it doesn't feel staged. It feels like this is this is where we live. And Peterson, who we all love, is a he got a brilliant artist, a great guy to work with. I, I'm not saying if I didn't say you were a great person to work with, that doesn't mean you're not. But I just these are the people <laughs> I've dealt with. These are the people that I've really dealt with, though, you know, like I'm Peterson. Here. Peterson, I, um, I love his art. I love Peterson. And uh, you can quote me. So you sold that piece as well. Yeah, yeah, great. Excellent. Uh, uh, Philip Wrangler is another one that's not as recognized around here. It's so like, God, I love this. Um, but it looks so kind of Florida. There's like that washed out Florida kind of thing. And, and it's on a billboard. And I, I'm glad that we got this because it really looked great uh, in person. And Robert uh, Banjo, who did this kind of Austin coffee house place, which is a really great piece, which he gave me a T-shirt of. So that also sold. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Simple, um, who does like a lot of woodworking too, and I love his piece because it's not. I love his work because it's not always the same too. It's very like he's gonna. He feels like he's always kind of evolving. And Samantha has that feeling too, like she's she's like in the midst of like change and all that, but she's, it's always like brilliantly done. And these are two people that I really love to work with too. Um, next next on our, so, oh, I love this Simona. This reminds me, because when I lived in the apartment above the gallery, <laughs> this is what it looked like outside. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, I know it looks like a gang, or like it's crazy, but it's, this is really like, it's really well done because it's a little um, um, sort of um, almost like, uh, it's very dreamy too. It's really, really brilliant. And it's actually Creative City Immerse Project. Oh, it is? Yeah, so, so the sign there is uh, sponsorships. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Now I see it. Uh, so, um, and Skip always does really great work. And uh, this is really, I love this piece. And it really looked good on a billboard. It was just like, um, yeah, so these people are super talented. And I just met Simona. I'm glad. Tick, I tried to get Tick to show a couple times at the gallery, and he uh, so he wasn't available. But God, I, God, I love his work, and I'm glad he was available for this. This is great. And Wayne Grant, who um, used to come in and out of the gallery, and is kind of like, that kind of hidden documentarian of the downtown Orlando, kind of not the not the visit Orlando kind of downtown Orlando, but it's really he really hits like captures like what you see when you walk around sometimes. A really amazing guy. Um, go, so, Honey Hogan. Honey Hogan, do I? Do uh, I you can talk about me. <laughs> no, it, that was just to remind me to uh, that will switch. So yes, thank you, Pat. Thanks for talking about all the different. Um, artists and the different billboards. I'm going to spend 30 seconds just going through the less fun part, which is all of the logistics and like, how did we make this exhibition happen? So, you know, we did a call to artists and um, it was an online form process. And like Barbara said, we needed to be able to pay for this project and pay for everyone for their work in this project. So we solicited sponsors and we thankfully to, uh, we're super thankful for everyone on the right hand side here who supported this project directly. And also we're very passionate about supporting the project. We also built its own website because there were just so many people who asked a lot of questions about the project. We did all kinds of social media campaigns first to do the artist selection announcement, which Pat did a full like live stream announcing who he selected. That was a really fun experience. We also did an Instagram campaign where we launched uh, or showed little mock-ups of each of the billboards once they were selected. We did a press release, which generated a lot of earned media. And this was our ad in Orlando Weekly on the right-hand side. And then to our surprise, we got the cover of Orlando Weekly 
uh, that week and were also featured by Bungalower. But the cover was examples of photos that people sent in on their own of like, you know, billboards in the wild. And so it was very fun to see that and to also, you know, get the credit. It was very nice. And then here are some examples of our artists who, you know, took to their own social media posting um, themselves visiting. And then in the middle, that's Crummy Gummy's grandmother in front of their billboard. So again, we're very proud and everyone's just been, was excited to share all of their different experiences. There yeah, we go. I really, I really like that people uh, sent in their, the photos and I'd get texts. Hey, I saw this on Curry Ford. I saw this on there. And it was like, it was so fun because I was, I get messages from people I didn't really know. We're like, Hey, send this in. And it was really like, uh, kind of a, made it more um, participatory sort of. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all so much. That was such a thoughtful and thorough presentation. And I, I think that's just such an exciting project. And like I said, when I saw my first billboard in the wild, as uh, <laughs> someone just said, honey, when you were out said, hiking, uh, when I was exactly when I was in the wild and I saw my first billboard, I, it was, yeah. it was a really engaging, yeah. um, effective experience. And I, you know, I, it caused me to uh, get honked at because I was lingering a little bit longer <laughs> than I probably should have at a red light. Um, and I think that that is maybe the challenge perhaps of what I perceive when it comes to working in this medium, working with billboards, the, trying to find that balance. And I, maybe Pat, you could perhaps like uh, explain a little bit more or anyone can explain a little bit more about how you sought or curated a balance between um, that nuance and that, um, that some of these rely on a lot of ironies. I think that's really interesting um, and visual complexity, uh, conceptual complexity. I mean, these are really, some of these are really um, uh, thoughtful pieces in terms of the ideas that I think that they're purporting. So uh, how do you balance that with the medium of a billboard, which as the Orlando Weekly, I think just showed art at the speed of life. You have to move pretty quick. Well, I think that, um... That's, I mean, I thought about like the idea that you're going to be driving by it quickly and especially the digital ones, but which I actually never saw any of the digital ones. But like, I would, but, but I do think that um, you have to have stuff that actually sort of looks a bit like it could be an advertisement, even though that, that might not be a vague, I mean, could, the spectacle element or something that where you look up there and you go, you have, it has to be a quick, like sometimes if there's just like somebody sent me some abstract stuff and sometimes that can work. And some of it I did have on here, but but sometimes if it's just like black and white, if, if in the if if I have it with twenty nine other artists, it can work probably. But but I do have to feel like there's got to be a lot of stuff that really just is eye catching and kind of goes. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to add a couple of things to that question. Um, well, first of all, the the static boards were not on the highway, so those were you know more your commuter road, so it wasn't as fast to see it. And that's just the way the billboard companies actually uh, plan, you know, the, that size board to be in a space where it's easier to, to see. So mm -hmm. it's not as, as speedy. Um, but secondly, um, you know, I think we learned a lot too, because, you know, the horizontal pieces versus the vertical had a different feel to it. And I think if, you know, I don't, I don't know if we would want to do this, but in some cases, you know, it had to be cropped so you could actually see the art and get permission from the artist to crop it. Um, but ideally, you would have something that's horizontal that works with a billboard, you know, for all of them. So you kind of have that same view, um, you yeah, know, but it did work. But you, I mean, you could see just in the examples, like Peterson's piece was vertical, you know, so it looked a lot smaller on the board. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the continuity of the layouts was really great, you know, so you could tell it was one project and uh, we didn't get to pick out the locations that was, you know, basically what was available through the billboard company. Um, so if you were paying full rate, you would be able to pick your location. <laughs> um, but I thought overall it was a real great collaboration. And like I said, there were some learning lessons for us as well. Well, Barbara, are you offering this again? Are you going to be re doing a new selection uh, of artists in the new year or? We'd like to, I think, um, you know, we're still discussing that um, amongst our team, which is, you know, how it started from the beginning. So, you know, my, my thought is, you know, is it too much to do it every year or is it, 
you know, more special if you do it every other year. Um, probably everybody would love to see it every year. So if we can make it happen, I think we'll move in that direction. And it, we, uh, we also, be great. Um, another thing too is, is that uh, like if, if you would have, like when Barbara mentioned the location of the billboards, I think if they would have sent out a map showing me the location, I, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have been as excited once I went to these places, I realized, oh my God, there's like a restaurant sitting underneath there where I can park. Mm -hmm. and, and since they were like not the top uh, sort of advertising locations, but they were perfect for showing art. They were like really, because you could pull up and get out of the car, you could go up there and look at them. And, and they were like, most of them you get out of the car and just go and look at it. And I thought this is re it really worked out. And it, that was a, a big learning kind of lesson there too, you know, because what, because um, yeah, if they would have said, you want this one. And I, I think I was thinking I4, but now looking back, I4, is not as good as like curry ford really <laughs> right right so. you, you don't have the time to linger especially yeah, in those yeah, new express yeah. lanes well unfortunately <laughs> sometimes unfortunately sometimes you do have the time to linger. <laughs> oh, that's true i suppose that's true i you know i hate to have you all played favorites but i would love to think about so the the medium of the billboard is so political especially here in florida i'm thinking about all of those political billboards or um religious billboards spiritual billboards that are long um i-95 oh, right. right and and um, turnpike and i mean they're so shocking though when you see them um and they grab at you and, and are very disruptive and so i'm wondering if there's one or two if you each have a favorite perhaps in terms of the way they disrupted the politics of the billboard itself as a medium. Well, I, I'll start. I, yeah, go ahead, Barbara, and then I'll continue. Um, well, first of all, um, kind of going back to the idea of billboards. So one of the things to keep in mind is you don't want to have a lot of content on it, you know, so mm -hmm. you do want it to be able to get your message across quickly. Um, so, you know, working with our ad agency to lay it out, they helped with that. Um, but in terms of politics and kind of like a wow factor, I, I really thought that um, John Baker's image, as well as the um, piece that Philip did with the, the whales that were inflated, uh, that were deflated. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know if you remember that piece, but it was. Um, I know, think the baker is a really good point, though, Barbara. Sorry to cut cut yeah. in, but you're right. Like the the fact that it is in black and white, it, it lends that kind of almost like haunting quality to the piece, and it does have that just like singular chair. You're right. You can fixate on it. So um, I like yeah. that choice a lot. Yeah. And, and it also makes you wonder, like, what is what is happening there? Like, what is that about? And then the other one is is also political and, you know, environmental issues, you know, so the deflated whales were basically, you know, speaking to pollution and, you know, the aftermath. Sure. And Skips had that element, too, with the bird with the stomach filled up. And, and I, I kind of felt like some of the ones that Hani and I discussed called the were like John Baker's and different, the Florida project ones were kind of, I really um, probably, I mean, I loved all of them, but those definitely felt like they almost could have been oddball billboards, you know, like they just mm -hmm. felt like, but there's like, they're not really, really clear what they're selling. And I kind of really liked the idea that, and I love everything, but I just said that those actually almost at first glance look like, like John Baker's even could be like, well, wait, what is, what is this one for? You know, like if it was just left there, there is like an advertising without text, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then for me, from a professional standpoint, as the liaison between all of our sponsors, um, there are two that definitely stand out for me because they're the ones I had to explain the most. Um, and that's what's fun for me, right? Being that like hybrid of like being in the like, cool, fun art world, but then also balancing, like connecting the two worlds of the business and the creative world. And so of course, the one that really stood out was the, was locked up by Crummy Gummy. So the grandma and the handcuffs, um, I had to truly meet with both, with that, with each artist and get a full ex explanation about their billboards so I could present it to, some people who were like, why is this art? Or like, mm. why is the 
billboard, right? Like, why was this chosen? And then same with Wayne Grant's business as usual. That one's a little more obvious because it, you know, it's truly, um, you know, a man selling Trump merchandise, but mm-hmm. not obviously showing exactly that it says Trump, right? You can see that it says it, but It doesn't outright say it. So I would say from my perspective, it's that journey of not only understanding the context from each of the artists for myself, but being able to pass that message along to people who are, I wouldn't say not as open, but definitely have to be like, oh, well, this is why it's art, because this person said so, and this is the explanation of why they chose those Mm. works. and yeah, like with what Barbara said, I mean, cause Pat, Pat and I went through a, truly a journey with some of the works, some of the works that didn't end up getting selected. He and I were both on the same page for many of them of like, we're not sure, like we're not quite sure if that's going to be okay. We love it, but you know, we also also had to look at the context of who are the billboard company's clients is, yeah. do we have any works of art that um our you know critical commentary on those specific clients and we definitely did so that's that was another thing so i would say you know very proud obviously of pat for you know kind of taking that route of being like "Mm, we need to rethink this while we love this work is it is it the right one um do we want to ruffle that many feathers? Uh, we might not have even needed to ruffle a feather. It might not have even been an option, right? If we presented mm-hmm. certain works to the billboard company. So it, yeah, it's always interesting. Great. Yeah, no, it, all these are fantastic answers. Yeah, I, it's, it's also like, uh, oh, sorry, the crummy gummy then, one is actually in a Pentecostal church parking lot. Yeah, Pentecostal. that's interesting. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I could talk to you all forever. I, I do want to ask, uh, oh, we have one Q&A question. Uh, will you be presenting any of the runner-ups at any point? We didn't actually have official runner-ups, but we, it's like Connie and I had discussions of like people that we would have put in if so. Sure. Um, um, and I would love to- just... But we would, I would say there were about 60 that Pat was like, these are my absolute favorite, but but now we're looking at it from the context of Billboard. Like, and sure. so we narrowed it down from there. So to Shri, I would say no, because in the end we had 270 applicants, but only six, only 30 selected. So that would be a lot to try to coordinate. Cool. Oh, great. Hey, can I say something too? Because I've had some people go something about ranking and I like this, this there's not a one for, there's not a ranking i don't i don't do that with art because i really feel like it cheapens it and it doesn't really make any sense either because there's no real like it's subjective in in many ways but sure but but it's like like the idea of ranking is like to me is like i don't want to be that person you know because (laughs) you're number 213 you know like (laughs) yeah that's not going to make anybody feel good yeah. Always tough. It's always difficult it, to figure out like the and it's also like criteria. It's, it's, yeah, mm-hmm. it's like it's it feels like it's it's not uh I don't wanna I don't want anybody to be discouraged by anything, any decision I make. And I would rather find some way to encourage them because I feel like we had so much so many great artists participate and I would rather just encourage the people that didn't make it to not give up and to keep like, you know, because we might have really thought about them too. So Sure. So we are right at time. I would like to ask one last question of you, maybe just in the briefest of answers. Pat, you mentioned at the start of your talk, um, an LA based aesthetic, a Mexico City based aesthetic, these very place driven um, aesthetics that we see of artists kind of working there that we can tell an LA artist when we look at his or her work um, just immediately. And I would love to know your thoughts um, in just again, a few words, What is an Orlando-based aesthetic based on the works that you curated for this exhibition? I don't, I mean, I don't have a particular, but I also kind of like, I don't want it to be like, you know, to look like the obvious, like a tourist place. I kind of love it how like, we had like Pine Street, these different ones, John Baker, the different places that kind of like when you live here, you know what it is. You know, Mm -hmm. like this, you feel like this is an artist from around here 
but if you were visiting, you might not catch it. So I kind of feel like it's almost like we know, like you're capturing where we, you're capturing the feel of where we live. Like we sort of, and we would like to pass that on where like an LA artist is not showing Hollywood, you know, we're not showing this right. world. We're, we're showing like what it is to kind of be here, you know, sort of. Sure. Yeah, so. Pani, Barbara, any thoughts? I think irony. I feel like a lot of yeah. a, lo a lot of irony in some of sure. these works. Well, that's the um, Ford experience too. I think. I suppose so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and maybe maybe we could talk more about that at another time. But yes, Barbara, sir. honey, any other Thank thoughts? Thank you so much. Oh, I was just going to say that. Yeah. I was going to I was just going to add that I think there's so much variety. It's hard to narrow it down to like mm -hmm. an Orlando based type. You know, because there really is a lot of variety. Um, it sounded more like, you know, capturing Orlando, you know, not necessarily that their styles are all similar and sure. that we could tell that they're Orlando artists, but just uh, that a lot of the work resonates and kind of takes us to uh, places that remind us of Orlando. Yeah, I love it. Well, I will say that all of the selections that you chose and a map, which I, I greatly appreciate of the Court Art Project, the billboard um, billboards that you have up um, is on the Downtown Arts District's website. Hani, what is the website? So it's the quarterproject.net, but we are at a point now where most of the billboards have been replaced now. Um, they ran for actually eight weeks so we really were only planned for it running for two weeks but they ran a lot of them ran a little longer um yeah and so some of them still exist and like not every billboard has been sold right to the next buyer but it's very hard since it's 30 and they're all over all like in Kissimmee Apofka it's very hard for me to like fully keep track and it's also like I don't want to bother Clear Channel like once a week to be like, what is still up? Let me know. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I think they're like, all right, honey, like we've given you enough updates. So yeah, the corridorproject.net. Um, and then of course, um, as a team, once we decide how we're moving forward next, that the, that'll be something that we will post there and promote. But yeah. Great. Well, thank you all so much again for, for sharing your time, for putting together such an engaging presentation. Um, Thanks all right. for organizing this. Such a Absolutely. Pleasure. Absolutely. Bye. All right. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Bye. Always good bye. to see you. I'll see you. Bye. Bye-bye.